and in Wisconsin at 91.3 FM WRMW in Peshtigo. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. And now, battle ready with Father Dan Rehill. Good day. Welcome to Battle Ready. Let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love thee, and I ask pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love thee. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today I have a guest with me, a special guest, somebody I've known for many, many years. We were in seminary together, and his name is Daniel O'Connor. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Father. So good to be here. Yes, and I should tell our listeners that I remember you, remember you very fondly from seminary over a decade ago now. Father Thank Rio, you. You, then Thank you. Just, just ordinary old Dan then. He was always one of the few seminarians you could count on for always being at the, the Marian devotions, the adorations, the pro-life stuff. So you were a great inspiration to me then and to many others, and, and you still are today. So keep up the good work. Thank you very much. I remember you fondly as well. Uh, so I guess now we would call you a theologian. Oh, well, I'm just, I call myself just a knucklehead from New York, actually. <laughs> Fair enough. But you're, uh, you're a husband, you're a dad of four, uh, you work with many apostolates, divine will, divine mercy, two at the, at the top there. So you, you have a large breadth of um, knowledge you can offer, and we will tap into today. I wanted to begin because in the news this morning was the sad story that Kansas has mm. voted and decided they would prefer to keep abortion in their state. Um, and now that's sad for any state, but what's particularly alarming to me is that Kansas is a red state. It's a Republican state. It is 76% Christian right. and almost 20% Catholic. And that that's what's alarming to me because what what, what is happening? Where, where are people coming up with the idea that you can, you can uh, surf both believing in Jesus Christ and also in killing these babies. It, it makes no sense to me. Yes. Oh, that's so providential that you brought that up because, you know, we didn't discuss this at all beforehand. But when I checked the news this morning, I, I saw the same thing. And it was so devastating to me because, as you said, Kansas is a place we would have expected to, to be completely pro-life and to really enshrine pro-life laws as soon as they could. With We had such a great victory with Roe versus Wade being overturned. That could have been a moment of national repentance. But instead, what it's becoming is just a separation of the wheat and the chaff. And we've got a lot of people who should have been among the wheat deciding that they're going to be among the chaff. And it's a great sign of the times, I think. It is a sign of the times. My friend, Father Tom in Boston, um, he has a show called In Season and Out of Season. Where, you know, that, that headline referencing to Timothy 4. Mm -hmm. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be urgent in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort, be unfailing in patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itchy ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings and will turn away from the truth and wander into myths. Wow. Boy, are we ever in that day. That is absolutely today. And it's just it, such a perfect it, description of today. It really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, and for those who who are seeing the truth for what it truly is, like the real truth, the capital T truth, Jesus Christ incarnate truth, the word became flesh truth. It's so obvious what is good and what is evil. But for so many people, it's reversed. And it, it, don't you look at it and go, I don't know how they could uh, justify what they're saying, but they do. And it's almost like they've been blinded. There's like a mm -hmm. supernatural blindness that's come upon so many people, including a lot of the Christians, mm -hmm. even Catholics. Mm -hmm. And it's a very scary time for me in the sense of, I mean, I really don't have a lot of fear in general, but scary in the sense of if you can convince the whole world that evil is good and good is evil, then your world is going to get really, really bad really fast. Yeah. And it has. Right? It has. It, it, has. it has to, and it has, and it's... It's really unprecedented. We have to understand that if we're going to understand why what is going to happen will happen and even why what has happened has happened, why God is allowing it. And it's because 
the world is more mired in sin and error than ever before in history. And, you know, scholars, and, and I'm around plenty of them, obviously, they love to just describe, and I'm talking about scholars in, even inside the church, they love to say that, oh, this is just another cycle, you know, things have been bad before, this is, things will go back to normal soon on their own, this is nothing to, to be concerned about. And that's so completely, utterly false. What we're seeing now with the rejection of truth on the most fundamental level imaginable, we've never seen that before in the church, we've never even seen that before in the world. We've, you could look at the most twisted and perverse ancient pagan culture in the history books, and they didn't try to redefine marriage. They didn't, try, they didn't forget what a man and a woman is. They didn't, um, you know, they, some of these horrendously evil pagan, ancient pagan cultures had child sacrifice, but nothing like we have today in abortion. So it's unprecedented, the deluge of sin and error in the world today. And I don't, you know, I don't want to be a doom and gloom guy, but we have to understand that if we're going to understand why God, who is all love, everything he, do, everything he does or even allows in his permissive will is part of a perfect plan. And that perfect plan is going to hurt, and it has to hurt because of God's love. He's not going to let us continue wandering off this cliff that we're now just walking off of in numbers never before seen. Yeah, um, it's funny. I was just uh, yesterday reading um, a transcript from Cardinal Ratzinger from 1969, a radio broadcast. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's where he talks about the future of the church and how the future church will be much, much smaller, right. but much more holy mm -hmm. and uh, really will will start to look a lot more like the first century church. Absolutely. And um, I, it just... When I, I, you read through it and you go, boy, he, he really was a prophet uh, because he, this is before any of the craziness began, right. you know, right. the, the gender issues and the, the homosexual, all of it. It was all kind of still hidden. Uh, but but when you read it, it's amazing because he's saying the shift is coming and uh, a great power will flow from a more spiritualized but simplified church. And that's going to be it's just like the first century. Mm -hmm. And but there will be great martyrdoms mm -hmm. happening because. You know, when people see that the last bulwark against them getting their way, the last, like, uh, barricade is the church, and it really is the Catholic Church, because the Protestants have all folded on all these issues mm -hmm. for the most part, even the Jews to some extent, except mm -hmm. the Orthodox. Um, well, then that's going to become enemy number one. Right, right. We have to be removed, and uh, if we we don't rec and it's all going to come as hate crime, like because we don't recognize homosexuality and marriage of two men, then we're going to be haters. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to have these hate laws, as they I think they already have them in Canada, uh, where they can arrest you for saying such a thing. Yes, I think that just that also happened somewhere in Europe. I think Northern Europe, and it's happening in the UK. It's going to be everywhere in the Western world soon. This this great persecution, it is coming. And, of course, we need to not be afraid. God has, God has a perfect plan, as I said, and that um, includes, above all, our salvation and sanctification. But we need to set... I always use this phrase because I, I think back to the passion and Jesus setting his face like flint to endure his passion because it was the will of the Father. And we must set our faces like flint, meaning immovable. Set them right now to never contradict the truth, no matter what it costs us. And it will cost many of us martyrdom. Uh, not all of us, you know, God's going to preserve uh, a remnant, certainly, but it will, if you are blessed to be counted among those martyred, that's the greatest way you could possibly depart for your eternal home, is, is through martyrdom. So, whatever it costs to maintain the absolute 100% orthodox truth of the faith, you gotta be willing to give that right now. And if you're confused as to what that is, don't be. Open up your Bible, open up your catechism. That's the truth. Anything that contradicts either of those, no matter where it comes from, that's a lie. It is a lie. And that's the big thing right now. Truth, is, lies are being called truth. And with such uh, tenacity, like it's, it's, there's no other option but to believe what the people are telling you or selling you. Mm -hmm. uh, I was digging through some of our ladies' old messages from Medjugorje, and I came upon this one. It's about, oh, I guess, seven years old or so. It was from March 25th of 2015. And she talks about, this is what she said. She said, dear children, today the Most High permits me to be with you and to lead you on the way to conversion. Many hearts have shut themselves to grace, 
There it is. They've shut their hearts to grace mm-hmm. and have become deaf to my call. You little children, pray and fight against temptation and all the evil plans which the devil offers you through modernism. Mm-hmm. There it is. It's the summation. Be strong in prayer. It's she. She saw it. Of course, she saw it coming. She's in heaven. They have a bird's eye view of everything. But um, yeah, that that's the modernism of this this new offering that, and it really is, I think, the motivation of the Antichrist. Mm-hmm. Um, everything will be reversed from what we were taught through the scriptures and through Jesus Christ, and it's going to be uh, a worship of the flesh, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. And to do that. It's going to be, do not deny your passions. This is how you were made. Right. And I believe when this man comes on the scene, he's going to proclaim that he himself is the one who made creation and that he made us to love our passions. Mm-hmm. And it also says he is, um, it's somewhere in the scriptures, I have to go look at it. It says he he is someone who is not a lover of women. Hmm. Wouldn't that make sense? Interesting. Yeah. yeah. He might even be a, a, somebody who's openly gay. Who mm-hmm. knows? But uh, that's going to be the push towards everything will be about the flesh and pleasure. Right, right. Uh, which is exactly the opposite of why Jesus came. You know, he had, a, he had a life where he really had nothing. You know, for those years of ministry, right. he didn't even have a home. Right. And he lived off the providence of his father. Uh, how far we've come. Mm-hmm. in this day and age lower than the beasts themselves and uh, you know of course every human being has infinite intrinsic dignity made in the image of god but when we commit these horrendous sins and we when we succumb to these horrendous errors in a certain sense uh, we bec- we almost low uh, a, a human being almost lowers himself to a position of lower than the beasts because of an animal they can't sin they just automatically do god's will because they can't help but do it but when mm-hmm. we choose to rebel against our Creator, which we can do simply because we have a free will, we, in, in a certain qualified sense of the term, we become kind of lower than, than nature itself. And that is the fascinating reason why Jesus talks to the servant of God, Louis Picarets, about this a lot. But the elements themselves, he says, they take up the rights of their Creator. Not, of course, not that they're thinking this. It's just automatic. And they chastise us. And that's just part of the chastisements we're seeing today as a consequence of our sins. It's got, and I, I, we didn't talk about this before, so I'm sorry if I'm getting out there. But this, this this has nothing to do with CO2 or greenhouse gases or anything like that. This is... What were the storms, the floods, the droughts, the wildfires, the crate, and of course this also includes earthquakes and volcanoes and all of this natural chastisement we're seeing from the earth itself, that is nature rebelling against man's sinfulness. If we went zero carbon or whatever they're saying now, that would have no effect on it because that's, it's not about that. In fact, I would wager if we went zero carbon, as you know, Bill Gates and everyone is telling us, that would just be another rebellion against God because God tied our lives to carbon emissions you know we we need like from the beginning burning wood to heat and cook and and oil for light so we're not going to see any decrease in these wildfires and droughts and floods and and everything else until we repent and turn to god it's just part of these overall chastisements we're in right now because of our sinfulness sin and error as you said modernism our lady has warned us about this so many times throughout the past few decades especially and you brought up that Medjugorje message from several years ago. I don't have it in front of me now, but I think at, at Medjugorje, in one of the recent messages from just the last couple of months, she said that Satan is reigning as never before. Does that ring a bell? I think she said yeah, that recently. Okay, she did. It was. I think it was a June twenty fifth. Oh, as that never recently. before. Wow. Meaning, as never as before. Never what does before. that mean? It means so before the flood. Mm-hmm. Worse than that. Right. Before Sodom and Gomorrah. Worse than that. Exactly. Uh, Nineveh. Worse than them. It's, like you said, unprecedented. And and that, if you're not praying your rosary every day, if you're not deep in prayer every day, what are you waiting, what on earth are you waiting for? Mm-hmm. Like, does does the missile need to be aimed at your little town <laughs> before you get your Bible out and start praying? Yeah. Like, we're on the cusp. Right. We're on the cusp. And, you know, another one who has a remarkable gift of prophecy was St. Hildegard. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever read any of her stuff. A little bit, yeah. Boy, she talks about after the two world wars, this great evil that comes upon the earth and uh, and and how the twisting of truth would become at a level we've ne- that's never been seen. We're already in it. Uh, but And then it's going to get a little more rough before this great era of peace comes. Yeah. Uh, but that's the, that's the thing. There will be a triumph. There will yes. be a triumph of Our Lady and there will become an era of peace. And I think that's going to be kind of the era of the Holy Spirit because yes. – 
the spirit will gather everybody into this perfect will of God. And imagine what that, well, that'll look like heaven mm-hmm. is what that'll look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we pray for it in every our Father. It, exactly. It's the, the, the greatest <laughs> prayer we pray. That's, that's thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why are we praying that if it's not possible? Of course it's possible. Jesus wouldn't have, the only prayer he ever taught, the climax of that prayer, <laughs> thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Boy, did he do a foolish thing if that was impossible. So it's going to happen. And that's what we're, you know, above all, we're aiming for heaven, of course. That's our only eternal home. But temporally, we're aiming for the accomplishment of God's will on earth as it is in heaven. So it's not heaven itself. We don't, you know, as they always say, we don't get to heaven until we get to heaven, of course. We don't get the beatific vision until heaven. But there's nothing preventing his will, not his unveiled presence. That would be millenarianism. There's nothing preventing his will from reigning on earth as in heaven. So that's what this is a preparation for. God isn't sadistic. He's not... even in his permissive will, he's not allowing chastisements and all these other things and much more to come unless he knows that a far greater good will come of it. We, can, we know that from good theology, that God will never so much as permit, not even, per, not even allow, any evil to occur unless he knows with certainty that he's going to bring about a greater good from that evil that could not have been possible without allowing it. So the worse things get, the more hopeful you need to get. Because the more, because that makes you even more certain that his triumph is coming near. That the devil, when the devil's rage increases, why does it increase? I mean, we know from scripture, the devil's rage increases when he knows his time is short. Because the devil also knows the prophecies. He hates them and he rebels against them, but he knows them. He knows God will win. He knows our lady will triumph. The first promise in scripture, she will crush your head. Our lady is going to crush the head of the serpent. That's why he's le- that's why he's holding nothing back today. But that's also why we need chastisements like never before seen in history. You, you know, you emphasized, Father, that that worse than before the flood. Now, of course, God promised he wouldn't flood the earth again, but he didn't promise there wouldn't ever again be global chastisements. There will be for this purification. You know, we're seeing we're still in the natural chastisement portion of things, kind of. We're getting I, I would wager we're going to see it get worse, probably a third world war. We're already seeing economic chastisements, plague, of course, and I mean COVID, you know, what's what's worse about that is the government tyranny, but we're gonna see more of that soon, likely. So prepare your hearts for this. As you said, Father, if you're not praying the rosary every day now, repenting, getting to confession, please at least once a month. And I would also say, if at all possible, daily Mass. I know not everyone can do that, but if, if it's possible for you, please get to Mass every day. That's one of the most powerful things you can do. Get your soul ready now. And it's not confusing. It's not even that difficult to be ready, but you have to want it. You have to want it. So please want it and a very good inspiration for wanting it. And, which, and this is why all eschatological uh, considerations are useful because they inspire us to become saints. They inspire us to do more zealously what we already should be doing anyway, but which we make up all sorts of excuses for for procrastinating and putting off. Yeah, there's no shortage of excuses Mm -hmm. because the world is offering them up on a silver platter, Mm -hmm. just like John the Baptist's head. Um, When we think about this timeline in Revelation, and it is a tricky one because I think what John was describing was he was looking at everything at once and just had to write it down and so he puts mm-hmm. it out there mm-hmm. but if you if you try to put it in some kind of order it would seem like this storm hits the world and then there's this a war there's a great war as a result of the second seal and uh, very difficult times uh, tensions and then an economic disaster I think would be yes. the third one then diseases the fourth one uh, then the persecution suppression of the church and the mass, everything sacred removed, fifth one. And then the sixth seal, uh, per- perhaps that's the warning? I don't know. Yeah, I would say so. And again, this is speculation, of course. It's very difficult. 100%. Yeah, it's very difficult. 100%. And we're not presenting something that's binding as Catholic teaching or anything here. But, it's, but you know, that's in the Bible for a reason because we're supposed to read it and, 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 and ruminate on it. And I, I remember back before, you know, decades ago, before I read any Catholic prophecy, before I knew anything about prophecies, and I, w- I read Revelation, and, and I, it was confused. I was confused because when I read the seals, and you come to Revelation, uh, the sixth seal of Revelation, it looks like Judgment Day. It, like, everything <clears throat> seems to be ending. The stars falling from the sky, the mountains falling from their place. I don't have it in front of me at the moment, but... Um, 
but it's not Judgment Day because there's tons more after that. You know, that's this is relatively close to the beginning of Correct. the Book of Revelation. So what is it? It's a mini Judgment Day. It's something that's kind of a preview of Judgment Day. It's like Judgment Day, but well before the actual divine chastisement and the Antichrist and those things. And I think it makes perfect sense. In fact, I think it's by far the best interpretation even to look at that as a prophecy of the warning, which we know from so many mystics is going to be coming. This divine intervention, an act of mercy like never before seen in history. Why? Because it's needed. Uh, the blindness that you talked about, the people, this this barrier to grace, that, it, and we still need to do our best, and, and you can still do so much good by evangelizing and, and all that stuff. Please keep up the good work, but whoever tries that is going to hit a lot of brick walls also, because there's so many people who have just utterly shut themselves off, not only to God and, and Christianity and Catholicism, but to just reality. And... That is something that takes a cosmic divine intervention to break through. That's going to happen. If it's needed for our salvation and sanctification, then God's going to give it. We can rest assured of that because he's all powerful and all good. This, this warning, and I think you, you talked with Christine about this recently, so I won't, you know, I won't repeat all the things she said there, but it's important to know about because I think it gives us the direction, the kind of the... It gives us some advice on how to prepare for the times ahead. And I would, I would say it is by proclaiming the divine mercy, by as much as possible softening hearts and getting them ready to at least be open to God's grace. And that's going to be a, extremely effective in preparing souls for the warning, also preparing them for their deaths, whichever comes first to them. Mm -hmm. That Jesus, uh, he tells St. Faustina and the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, that he just holds nothing back at the moment of death to achieve the salvation of a soul. And obviously he doesn't succeed with everyone. Souls do go to hell. Don't believe anyone who says hell is empty. Um, but he, he tries absolutely everything possible to, he, he says to almost wrench from your soul an act of contrition in that moment of death. So, you know, he, remember, Jesus desires sal your salvation and the salvation of your loved ones far more than you ever could. And he's not going to leave any stone unturned in trying to get that. And whatever he doesn't get a chance to try during your life, he'll try in that moment of death. So we, how do we get people ready for that and for the warning, which is going to be a vision of the state of their souls infused in, directly into their minds, like, like almost like Judgment Day itself? We soften their hearts. We proclaim his mercy. We sow the seeds. We sow as many seeds as we can, and we pray that God gives them growth. You know, apologetics, that, that's good. We, we should know the answers to the questions people have, but... I think we should probably put a little less emphasis on just hoping we can win every apologetics argument and just get people into the faith that way. It's that we, of course, want people to convert, but that'll happen on God's timeline. What we can do now is we can get the message of his mercy out as much as possible while there's still time left with the door of mercy open. That door, it's about to close. The time of mer his mercy is infinite. The time of mercy is not. It's very finite. The... Um... Yeah, so the prayer and the fasting is so critical. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you look to people like St. Paul, the reason he was so effective at establishing all these communities is because he knew the power of the cross. The cross is the tree of life, and all life is coming through the cross. And so when he was persecuted, he would he would wield his persecution and accept it in a way to further fuel these communities. We can do the same thing mm -hmm. with the pagans of our day. You know, every day I pray every single day that everybody that dies today, please give them a true view of Jesus Christ and his love and mercy, and they would accept his love and mercy in their final moments in this life. If everybody started praying that prayer every day and everybody prayed a divine mercy for all the people who would die today, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the grace that's going out and rescuing people. And then when you have your little trials during the day, don't forget it's to it's to advance that grace because you can unite it to the cross and then supernatural power goes and that's the only thing that's going to change a hardened heart right. it's going to be god's supernatural grace absolutely it's not going to be my chastising of them <laughs> or my you know pro probing at them you mean you need to change you need to change they don't list oftentimes that pushes them further away right but my prayers united to Christ's cross will have a profound effect on those people who need to be converted. Yes. We're just about out of time. One final profound thought. Oh, <laughs> please take Father's advice to pray the rosary, the divine mercy chaplet. In the rosary, what do we do? We pray. We say, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. 
You are praying, yeah. especially for the salvation of souls at the moment of death. Because let's face it, most people today, they're not ready to die. If they're going to be saved, and please God, let them be saved, it's an outpouring of grace at that moment of death. You need to be a part of that with your prayers and sacrifices. Excellent. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, Father. You'll have to come back again. I would love that. Let me give you my blessing. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Have a wonderful day. This is Father Dan signing out.